Welcome to the Road to Zero podcast. I'm your host, Nick Leblanc, founder of Network Potential Consulting. We're here to explore the fast emerging zero impact economy, which is transforming the way we do business, bringing prosperity and regenerating the natural world in the process. And I invite you to look at how you can position your business at the forefront of this global movement. Today on The Road to Zero, we're talking to Craig Nickel, founder and CEO of Graphene Manufacturing Group, joining us from Brisbane, Australia. Welcome, Craig, and thank you for being with us. Thanks, Nick. It's good to be on. And can you tell us a bit about how you got into graphene and what interested you in that field? Yeah, so I'd spent uh, more than 20 years in um, in one of the largest energy companies in the world, Shell, and um, in various different uh, roles um, in different countries. Um, and I discovered that you can you can make a a um, a type of powder out of uh, out of natural gas, and it had this amazing ability to do various things. And it was called graphene. Um, at the time, people had largely taken graphene out of graphite and taken the cube of of or the or the block of graphite and whittled it down to atomic level product by splitting it apart. Um, and I became aware of this other process that's out there that you can split uh, methane into carbon and hydrogen. Um, and that was probably the beginning of the graphene bug. Um, usually, once you start to understand what graphene can do, you, 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 you don't tend to um, dismiss it or you know, get rid of it from your brain that easily. Um, so I put together a team of largely ex-shell guys, uh, engineers and, and also a finance person and we we pulled it together who have been all over the world and done work for Shell in different roles and what we've done is um pulled together this team that was sitting in brisbane australia largely kind of semi-retired or between roles but really wanting to look for that next thing and ha- wanting to ha- make an impact um yeah so we put together a a process on how to make a graphene from natural gas and only natural gas and we actually thought it was going to be quite simple um, and in the end, what we worked out, it was extremely complicated. <laughs> um, it, it, and, but in the end, we, we found a way through it, um, thousands and thousands of trials, and we had developed our own technology out of that. And then we came out and we said, oh, this is, this is our product. Then we realized actually that no one really had done it um, anywhere near the way we had done it. And, and therefore, we realized we had something a bit special. Um, and then the product that we'd made also we found was a bit special too. And um, and it was really only until you know, now, that was four years ago, now we know what the product can do a lot better. There's still We're still finding out what it can do, but we certainly know a lot more about it and what it can be used for. Uh, and that's when we found out how amazing the particular graphene we make, because graphene is a very large category. It's, it's like saying oil. There's all sorts of oils. <laughs> And all sorts of oil products. Well, there's all sorts of graphene, and they all have different uses and, and cases of of competitiveness. And ours has a very great capacity to transfer phonons, which are heat heat particles, and also store electrons, um, which is energy storage. Um, and so, about two years ago, we pivoted from looking at looking graphene into composites and all sorts of different um, bulk materials and reducing um, emissions through that way and pivoted to saying, well, um, using our energy markets knowledge um, for being in Shell for many years. And um, we said, look, let's focus on transferring heat faster. And let's also focus on um, energy storage, batteries. Um, Now, transferring heat faster means that things get more efficient. um, And transferring heat is one of the fundamental energy relationships that um, exists today. And energy markets exist based on how fast you can transfer heat. So if you can transfer heat, you can fundamentally change your energy relationship and your cost of energy and the emissions you have. So that's the first product um, that we focused on, or the first market rather. And 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 that led us into um, our coding solution with a partner we have that we we, we put our graphene on um, on air conditioning systems. So graphene coating, which we put on our air conditioning condenser systems, and that enables it to transfer heat faster, which then switches the compressor off faster, which then saves energy, saves money, and saves emissions. Um, and then we have another product, which is uh, graphene into lubricants. 
uh, as a concentrate, um, and we're working with a number of large um, um, lubricant blenders who can look at putting this in to reduce emissions. And then also now we've just started um, working on or uh, publicly, publicly working on our graphene aluminium battery, which is in the second category of energy storage. Um, so that, that's all very exciting. And in the end, um, delivering what we what we set out to do, which is to, to reduce, you know, make an impact, enhance society with our graphene and get deliver more uh, from less. So we are getting there, but we've still still got a long way to go. And then just to get a, a better idea of why graphene is such a special material, what, what does it have or do that, that makes it able to do these very interesting functions? Yeah, it's it's got um, a number of um, um, features and, and they're broadly categorized by two different professions, physicists and chemists. <laughs> so physicists pretty much developed it and talked about a one layer atom graphene and and it's a type of carbon allotrope. Um, so you have four types of carbon allotropes. Um, you have coal, you have graphite, you have diamond, and then you have graphene. Um, and so graphene is often quoted as a single layer of, of carbon, um, and the, it's a, you know, the carbon atoms are in a lattice form. It's a very strong, super strong um, in one dimension. Uh, and then also in that same dimension, you can transfer electrons really fast because um, it has some very large uh, loose electrons. Um, and then it has the ability to transfer heat. Just as a point for anyone who's, um, who's, who's listening and wanting to understand how carbon can um, transfer heat, well, that's the whole emphasis of carbon dioxide increasing our temperature because it can trap heat. Um, so it's for the same reason for... Um, uh, the uh, global greenhouse gas is being a, causing a problem in raising temperature. Um, and then, you know, just as a, as a byproduct, if you look at Venus and you see how much carbon dioxide is in Venus's atmosphere, which is 27%, I think, and you have a, a massively high temperature um, atmosphere. And that's because of carbon. Carbon traps heat really well. And that's what our product does too. It traps and, and then can it actually transfer heat, depends on how you use it. So those are the properties that we focus on. It's also extremely uh, lubricating. So if you think graphite, um, which is a, a big lubricator for many different industrial type products, well, graphene is just a few layers of that. So that's that's your chemistry, that's your physics background. And physics is interesting because you can say it's this type of structure and it's one layer or two layers thick, and you say that's what that's what physics tells you. But really, it's the chemists who actually make graphing work and that's where ke chem chemistry will come in and they'll be able to functionalize it which means put it into things and put things on it so it can actually be in everyday items that then we can use um, if you like a one layer of graphene is not very usable um, it's extremely interesting to talk about it's like using a mirror you know there's not too many things you can use a mirror for apart from looking into it <laughs> Um, it's just too shiny. So what chemists like to see are actually things you can attach it to. So you don't want perfection with to put it into things with chemistry. You want multi-layer, you want few layer, and you want a graphene effect, not a graphene dis dis a dimension. And the effect that you often see, depending on the product, for graphene on transferring heat and storing electrons, it can be anywhere up to 100 layers. So the layer debate is... Um, whilst I have a kind of a physics background, a mechanical engineering kind of domination in my career, uh, the chemistry the chemistry will make graphene the everyday material. Um, and I think that's that's how we've kind of grown into it. We've learned through the physics and into the chemistry and then how to functionalize it, put it into fluids, put it into batteries. That's all chemistry. And and hence it's it's not necessarily therefore the uh, number of layers, but it's the effect. And that's what we focus on. Um, and you you will have different graphenes that are really good in some cases and are not so good in other cases. And I think that's what every graphene company is either working through it now or have worked out. And that, that's that's the most important um, thing for, I guess, for people to understand is that you, you probably won't have a graphene that will do all things. Yeah, and I really like how you've, you've actually, because this is a technology I've seen where 
we're splitting natural gas into hydrogen and this other stuff. And a lot, a lot of places they're, they're, they're getting it in a solid form. So it doesn't go in the atmosphere, but it's really mm -hmm. interesting what you can do with that and the kind of super materials that you're making out of that and, and taking a lot of those properties. So it's not just a way to mitigate CO2, but it's actually turning to be a very lucrative industry in some ways. Yeah. It, yeah. The, the ability to take heat out in really specific applications say like in air conditioning cooling, means that you can get years and years and years of better heat transfer, which in the end reduces tons of CO2, which is far more CO2 reduction than you've ever used to make the graphene in the first place. So you're talking in the end, you're talking thousands of times CO2 negative, these products can be, thousands because they can sit on an air conditioning system years and years, save tons and tons of CO2. And then they might've only taken a few kilograms of CO2 to make. So that is the, that is the really interesting thing where you turn science, you turn, you turn carbon into, into the savior so much as, as the, as the, you know, the, the devil that it, that is, it is right now. Um, and that is, it's exactly what we believe it as. It has the potential to be that. Um, and you know we we want to show that through our products. We want to show that through um, the science, the nanoscience that we do. Um, we 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 tried to work out how to sell our graphene in powder, and in the end, that's just very difficult. It's a very difficult product to work with, um, and it's very light. Our graphene is extremely light, um, something like one fiftieth the light lighter or less dense than water. Um, it will literally float away in the air. So you you tend to um, have problems with just handing it out to people, obviously in controlled conditions, to be able to work with it. So we developed that way, and we put that into our second factory, which then we put into fluids, and then we, we use the smallest minute amounts that fundamentally change the way that product then transfers heat or lubricates or in the end stores charge. Um, and I think that that makes a... Um, some really next generation products. Um, whilst we don't aim to do that, we're just trying to meet a customer's need. Um, now there are some really interesting theories about this. So the science is, is I think, behind the application, and um, and that's okay. You know, sometimes you need to go ahead of where the science is, and the science kind of then tends to catch up. Um, you know, there, there is a there is a, 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 a tranche of theory around quantum thermodynamics. There are some universities in in different world leading universities around the world that that do um, do take courses in it, and it's about how graphene does transfer heat at quantum level, um, and it doesn't bend physics. I mean, it doesn't change the laws of physics; it just bends them, um, and that enables you to do some pretty amazing things, um, like painting an air conditioning condenser um, and then making it cooler which is a bit like putting on a sweater and then being cooler. That tends not to happen. But um, through to a, a various different mechanisms that it, that it actually provides, which is massive surface area, which is increased in heat transfer, um, area rate, um, obviously very high heat transfer, the high, highest heat transfer rate you can get. Um, it tends to do these things that, that then you, you, know, you, you, you scratch your head and then through really empirical um, outcomes, you're able to then go, well, this is how it can work and this is how this is the business we're going to build from it um, and it's really only through trial and error that we found these things um, and with good intent but always just seeing what the outcome is after after doing it in in a um in in, in applications yeah it sounds like you guys have been experimenting lots and discovering lots sounds like thomas edison and his factory trying to figure out how to do the light bulb uh, yeah but... well we did to make our graphene the first time i think it was over five thousand trials in the and where we got to in the end um obviously it's, it's a trade secret um if we published it then everyone every person in there and their dog would would be able to copy it straight away um so what we what we did in the end was create a very unique sort of dimensions and all sorts of different types of controls which enabled it to happen with only um, natural gas um and then of course we have hydrogen that comes off that um but you know, you need to provide a, a platform and that's what any new technology has. You have to have a platform for people to use your technology. And that platform for, our, for us is basically fluids. We have a platform, which is a nano fluid, 
um, where our graphene goes in and we do all the nanotechnology and then the fluid can then be used um, in prescribed manner, very safely. Uh, it's fully dispersed into the fluid and then that fluid can then get hopefully some real energy reduction impacts and emission reduction impacts for, for our customers. And that's, that's really what we're focused on now. We've just signed a non-binding LOI with a company in Dubai, which we've been working with um, for, for a few years now. And that has had um, the, the next positive step, we think will show some really good early stage, you know, significant revenue for the group, for, for, for graphene manufacturing group. And um, we're really looking forward to kind of going through that process, getting into a distribution agreement, and then progressing into a, a situation where we can take some substantial revenue and really change the way air conditioners um, consume energy in, in the Middle East, uh, which is really quite exciting. That, that market has got an enormous amount of energy and emissions linked to air conditioning. And so we think you know, that those, those early steps will show how massive this opportunity is to, to use our graphene coding system on existing air conditioning systems. Um, so you don't have to go and put in a new one to get any higher um, benefits. <clears throat> but then we'll be able to show how that can also work around the world as well. Yeah, I can see that the massive impact and savings for the customer, and especially in this world where energy prices are going up, or at least we're looking for sustainable energy, it's a big impact. But mm -hmm. what I'm curious to know too is a bit more about the uh, aluminum ion battery you've been developing, just to hear a little bit more where, where that's at, where do you see that going? Yeah, so this is kind of a bit of a blue sky project, really. It's how big is it, it and then where it can go is is really unknown at this point. It's a project with University of Queensland, which we've been working for some years on many different projects. And just to be clear, we have a number of different um, graphene battery projects with different universities progressing. But this this one is, is quite special, and it keeps continuing to uh, provide, if you like, uh, keeps on giving. So it's fundamentally a graphene and aluminium um, battery. Uh, there really is nothing else to it um, of any note. Um, so there's there's no lithium, uh, there's no copper, uh, there's no manganese, there's no cobalt. Um, and what it provides is a, a, a reasonably high uh, energy density and then a very high power density. Now, power density is not really talked about these days because um, lithium batteries lithium ion batteries have very low power density, so much so that it's kind of almost not talked about <laughs> uh, because of that reason. So our power density is anywhere up to about 7,000 watts per kilogram, which means it can be charged really, really fast, um, somewhere 60 to 70 times faster than a lithium ion battery. And that and that's for two, two reasons. One is our battery tends to have very little impedance, so it, it's very low resistance, internal resistance, so it can be charged very, very fast. It also has very low heat increase from that. So there's really no potential for it to have, uh, say, catch fire or be, you know, overheating or uh, thermal runaway. The lithium batteries, although there's all different types and you, sometimes it's a bit hard to be generalist, but generally you can't really charge faster than, say, two amps per cell. And that really restricts its power density. And generally, if you try to charge it too fast it, or faster than that, it it can have some problems. It can have some runaway. You can um, literally even blow up and there's been cases for that and big companies being taken to court over them over the use of them it it is a it is an issue that is probably not as well known is that the lithium ion battery certainly has a lot of strengths and it's um enabling this next whole you know, energy transition but it doesn't definitely has a lot of uh a lot of things that in an ideal world you wouldn't have so it's early days for a graphene aluminum ion battery. It's obviously a pretty low cost battery um, in terms of make. Our graphene, we, we can make that at pretty low cost already. And then the aluminum is obviously very low cost, especially certainly compared to lithi um, lithium. It's a thousand times more available than lithium. And obviously it's more recycled than any other material on earth. 90% uh, of aluminum is recycled. So our battery has so far seen more than 3000 cycles. Now, the best way to describe that is if you just charged your phone once a day, 3,000 cycles would then see you sitting at 10 years and you go, oh, that's, that's okay. Um, but what the issue is that we're not seeing any performance reduction after, after that, say, 10 years um, or 3,000 cycles, which is really quite amazing. That's, that's kind of unheard of. Um, Lithium-ion batteries tend to have a, um, a reduction in performance 
after say a thousand cycles, maybe even less, and they might get down to about 60%. And that's tendingly why you tend to go get a new phone. After say three years, you find that you can't really get far during the day without re re recharging it. That's because there's there's been a, a build up um, and your, your battery's not coming back to the way it was. Um, and that's where people tend to go and get a new phone or, or they start to get just a bit disappointed with their phone. That does seem to be one barrier that we've broken. We'd, I think if we did put our phone in your, our battery in your phone, it would, would charge in, you know, about a minute, um, a lot better than what you have right now out there. The other really interesting point that, uh, Nick, is that we have a very high energy density in terms of volume. So what's often talked about um, is what hours per kilogram, and that's what's, you know, the the various different big companies, EVs especially, talk about. But what uh, personal appliance um, battery buyers want to talk about are what hours per litre. And because we're basically a very thin battery, we actually have a lot of storage potential per litre, a lot more than existing. Uh, and that's really, really exciting. And, you know, early stages, we're looking at about a 1,000 watt hours per litre, which is, which is really quite a performance um, shift. For, for your personal electronics. Now, in the end, although we're at about 150, 160 watt hours per kilogram on our on energy density, the end top maximum theory for our battery is 1,040 uh, watt hours per kilogram. So that is a substantial way. We've, that means we've got something like 800 or so watt hours per kilogram we can do further work on and increase the energy density on this battery. So where this battery could actually end up is literally anywhere. Um, it would have the ability to go into personal electronics right now. But over time, I think you'll see its ability to go into EVs, grid storage. And then also you could see it even look at potentially replacing uh, hydrogen. Maybe not infrastructure hydrogen, that would be too much, but certainly large truck uh, hydrogen or long haulage hydrogen which I think that people would probably prefer, whilst I'm a big believer in hydrogen, would probably prefer to be able to have charge really fast charging battery in rather than have a, um, a hydrogen tank on, on the truck. The, the pinch potential to roll this out is, is huge. That's all understood. What we do need to work out though is what's the first step? What's the next step? And, and that's absolutely, you know, we're working through right now. We've had over 100 companies um, globally reach out and uh, express interest in wanting to work with us and or buy our batteries in the space. And we're trying to work out which ones to feed first and to work with first and to answer queries first. And, you know, every day we have more coming in, more interest coming in. The world is, is very much needing these new types of batteries. You know, that's clear. Um, people want to go to the next stage. And I know there will be others out there as well that will be meet, rising to the challenge. And and I think that's fine because it, the, the market is absolutely unlimited and it, there absolutely is huge need of all different types of batteries. And so, you know, that's that's the space we're in right now. It's 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 fun, but it's also, you know, it's also a lot of work. Sounds like uh, the, the door is getting really busy with a lot of knocks. And I'd be just curious with your battery. I hear you're, you're, you've got it more in a format for like personal type devices. So it's more small scale. And what do you see in the near future? And I see it could definitely scale up and... And, and what a game changer that would be for, for grid batteries and, you know, electric car, any, any kind of electrification of vehicles. So, so what format is your battery in now and what do you see and how soon do you see it go somewhere else? Yeah, I think right now we're, we're just focusing on coin cells because it's quite an easy format and voltage to, to match. Next, after that, we'll, we'll look at pouch packs, small pouch packs. Now we could go into 18650s, which obviously would be usable in grid storage and, and a lot of different types of devices, but obviously mainly electric vehicles. But it just that that format or that pack design is to release, you know, heat as well. And we don't we don't think we'll have that problem. And an 18650 to pack is not the best cell to pack ratio. There is a lot of air in there, which we probably won't need and we won't need the cooling either. So um, which you have in an, an EV charging situation. So really it's it's about having that that roadmap and developing that roadmap and getting it right and then working through that with you know potential global partners. 
um, in that space and then eventually finding a way into EVs and grids at the right time and in the right way. You know, the, the worst thing is you, you could just get bamboozled and you know, drink from a fire hydrant and then, then, and then not get anything done. So we've, we've got to focus step by step and get through this um, like we have with everything else we've done. And what are you um, looking for? If you'd say anything to the audience, what, uh, who do you want to partner with or what, what would further your goals the most at this point in time? You know, one thing we're working on is are we looking for a one platform type uh, user or buyer um, of the battery or are we looking at a multi-user kind of platform. And that's something that, you know, we are thinking through. You know, I think there is some clear benefits that can be gained by people who use our batteries. And and then what do you, how do you, um, how do you choose how that happens? How do you go through a process um, on that? Um, and that's that's not simple. And really, you know, any, are there any partners we can bring to to, to commercialise this faster? We, we, are, we, we, we propose to have our coin cell commercial prototype out by the end of this year. Because of the ability to use existing technologies, we can actually look to start producing and commercialize this next year. So that's how fast we can run. You know, that's what we would hope to do. But um, there are a number of things we've got to work through and you don't necessarily want to deliver it fast and then cut off your nose on something else, right? So you've got to do this right and pick the right platforms and partners. Pouch packs are very interesting. They come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. We've got um, personal electronics all the way through to an air taxi type uh, arrangement because air taxi really can't work with a lithium ion battery. The um, energy density is too, too low, uh, too heavy that is to charge. And they often just can't take the power um, that you need to lift people off multiple times a day without a whole lot of cooling and that creates issues with uh, energy density. So. Our battery seems to have hit that nice little point of which does both power and energy density. And so there, there's everything from existing technologies, which are massive, through to new technologies, which could enable this battery could enable. Yeah, we, we do need to be open to that as well. What is the next technology that could be batterified, so to speak? Well, thank you for sharing that with us. I see right now you're really dealing with managing the energy, the genie from the bottle and trying to trying to see where it goes. So I'm really excited to see what you'll have in the near future and how that'll change things. It's really a game changer technology. So definitely uh, acknowledge you for the amount of work and effort it took to figure out how, even how to do this and, and kind of really get to the holy grail of what chemists have been looking at for some time. Yeah, indeed. That's, that's pretty much what, it, what it's about. And then, and then making sure we, um, we keep delivering for our shareholders, which is what we're there for, um, in, in a way which meets their, their demands. Like they, they want to see a change. That's why people invest in us. They want to see a change. They want to see an outcome. They want to see energy transition delivered. I strongly believe energy transition has already happened. We're just catching up to it now. We've made a decision. The world has made a decision. We are changing. We are just now delivering on it. And people invest in us largely because of that. They want to see a delivery. They want to see an outcome. So um, lofty goals, yeah, interesting. Delivery on reduction of emissions, fascinating. So that's what we're that's what we're about. Well, it's great, great challenge, and uh, yeah, look forward to hearing the news from you. And thank you very much for uh, taking away from your busy day and having a bit of time to us to share what you're up to. Thanks again. Uh, appreciate it, Nick. All right, enjoy the, the rest of your day out in Australia. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today. Check us out at www.futureproof-network.com to hear our other episodes, links to our YouTube channel, and to join our Future Proof Business Network. See you again in our next episode.